So my name is Delaney. I am the Nebraska Wildlife Education Coordinator with Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And with me, I have Laura. Hello. And she is a wildlife education assistant out here with me. And we are actually based in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. So we are all the way on the western side of the state. Yeah. So we are here with Science of Migration. And you may be thinking, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, why are you in Nebraska? We don't have any Rocky Mountains. Well, the birds don't know that. We are here to study birds, learn more about birds, conserve birds. And so our work radiates all the way through the Great Plains to the Rockies, all the way down to Mexico. So our mission is to conserve birds and their habitats through three different teams that we have of science, stewardship, and education. And Laura and I are here today with you with the education team. So migration, what is migration? Yeah, so it flies to a warmer spot. Does anyone else wanna add on to that of what migration is? So why do birds migrate? So how do we know what we know about migration? How do we know migration exists? How do we know that birds migrate? Yeah, so we can actively see and observe birds moving around. Maybe one day we have robins in our yard at our feeders and then a month later they're gone for a while. So exactly that. Today, we are gonna go into one way that scientists have learned more about migration and the science behind that, that is bird banding. So have any of you ever heard of bird banding or been to a bird banding station before? No hands up. No hands, okay. So this is something that we do out here in Western Nebraska is bird banding. And we're going to watch a video that explains what bird banding is. And we'll talk about the why during our activity. Let me just get it so that way we can see and hear the video. Have you noticed more birds in your neighborhood during the spring or fall? Maybe you've seen them flying overhead or heard them singing up a storm in the morning? You're not imagining things. Migration is underway. Nebraska is home to more than 400 species of birds. And during our cold, bugless winters, less than half of those species stick around our state. So how do the rest of the species survive winter? They migrate. Understanding when, how and where birds migrate helps us better understand the amazing life of birds and what we can do to protect them. One way scientists learn more about bird migration is through bird banding stations. What happens at a banding station? Let's find out. At a banding station, there are special scientists called bird banders. To be a bird bander, you need a special scientific permit and a lot of experience and training. This assures each bird is handled with care and expertise, and their safety is always top priority. Banders place bracelet-like aluminum bands with a unique number on birds that pass through the station. But before they can ban the birds, they have to catch them first. To do that, lightweight, hard-to-see mist nets are put up in areas with great bird habitat, often found along known migration routes. Birds passing by might not be able to see the nearly invisible net, causing them to fly in and land in its pockets like a hammock. A bird bander does a net run by checking the nets carefully every 15 minutes for birds. If a bird has been caught, the bander carefully and expertly untangles the bird and places it safely in a breathable cloth bag. All the nets have been checked, several birds have been caught, now it's banding and measuring time. First, the bander gently places a light aluminum bracelet-like band around the bird's leg. Remember the unique number we mentioned? 
This number is recorded in a data sheet alongside the bird's species code, location, and measurements. Data recorded at banning stations across the country are all sent to the USGS Bird Banning Laboratory database. So if this bird happens to get caught again, say at another banding station 300 miles south, scientists from that station can look up this number, compare the bird's movements over the years, and add to their knowledge of how far and where this bird journeys during migration. Once the bird is banded, the bander sets to work taking measurements that tell us about the bird's age, health, if it's a male or female, and its overall condition. This includes measuring the length of the wings, the tail, weighing the bird, and even checking its belly for fat. This tells us how much energy it has stored up for its long journey. The last step, of course, letting the bird go, watching it fly off to continue on its migration journey. Bird banning has been around for over 100 years now, and through this method, scientists have learned a lot about bird populations, migration routes, critical habitats, and more. The more we understand about birds, the better we can understand how to protect them, assuring thriving bird populations for the future. So next time you see new feathered friends visiting your area in the fall or spring, take a closer look at their leg for a special band and wish them luck on the rest of their migration journey. All right, does anyone have any questions about bird banding after that video? They are, she asked if it hurts the bird when they put the band on. Yeah, so it does not hurt the bird. Um, it goes around the, the bird's leg loosely. So here I have my watch. Um, I'll put my watch on. And so they put it, it's loose enough on the bird so that it can move up and down the bird's leg, but it won't fall off the bird's leg. So it won't go past its foot. So kind of how my watch is, I can move it up and down, twist it around. So that's how a band sits on a bird's leg. So it doesn't hurt it. It weighs very, very little, so the bird hardly notices it, that it's there. The band is made out of aluminum, which is pretty light, and the band weighs about 0 0.005 grams, which is extremely light, very, very light. They do not have any more questions. Awesome, so we will move on. So why do we ban birds? We ban birds to tell individual birds apart. So this bird I have here on the screen is called a house wren, and it looks pretty similar. Like there, it's hard to tell one house wren apart from another. And so that's one major reason that we ban birds. And we also gather a lot of very useful data about migration and some other things from banding birds. So today with our activity, we are going to become the bird banders. But instead of banding birds, we're gonna band ourselves and collect data on our classmates because we are all unique and different individuals from everyone else. And we are gonna understand how unique and different we are from everyone in our class. And so what we will need for this is our classroom banding data worksheet. We'll need one pipe cleaner per student. We'll need some coloring supplies, markers, crayons, colored pencils, and then a variety of the beads because we'll use all sorts of colors. And so for the worksheet, this is the, this should be the first page of the worksheet. So this is the one we are gonna be using right now. So with this part of our activity, this will represent banding and taking the measurements of one bird. So you have a bird in hand and this is kind of what this activity represents, even though we will be banding ourselves and coming up with our own key and measurements. No, we're not touching the beads yet. So what we need to do is you see we have a key here. Well, our key is blank and we a blank key doesn't help us. So we together as a class, we'll decide which color represents each category. So my first question, we're gonna start with age. Is there anyone 
in the Eddie. class that is 12 or 13 years old? No. Okay, we can cross that one off. We don't need a color. Okay, cross that off. off. And then is there anyone in the class that is eight or nine years old? We have some nine-year-olds. Okay, and then do we have 10 and 11 for the rest? We do have 10 and 11-year-olds, yes. Okay, so what we need to do now is we need to determine, and everyone's key is going to look the same, what color do you want to use to represent eight to nine? Matthias, what color? Uh, eight and nine is yellow. So eight and nine is yellow. Okay, so color in the circle by eight to nine, make sure that's yellow. And then if you are eight or nine, you can put a yellow bead on your pipe cleaner. So now we need to decide on a color for 10 to 11. 10 to 11, um, Bentley. Red. Red, awesome. So if you're 10 to 11, you can put a red bead on your pipe cleaner now. And make sure you color in your key. Every okay, so everybody should have one bead on their thing. It's either red or it's yellow, depending on your age. Put your hands on your head so I can see if we have that. All right, we are ready to move on. All right, so for family, we need to determine a color for siblings. And you don't want it to be red or yellow? No, nope, it, it has to be a different color. Okay, so for sibling, this one is different. So if I, if you have two siblings, like one brother and one sister, you put on two beads. So one bead per sibling. Okay, so one blue for each sibling. Is there anyone that doesn't have a sibling? Uh, we have one to cost. Okay. The, uh, so I do. You do have a sibling? Yeah, I have a sibling. Oh. Um, everybody has a sibling. Okay, so we can cross out the nun category on sibling, on family. Okay, we are ready. All right, so for pet, we need a color to represent dog, a color to represent cat, a color to represent other, and then if someone, if you have no pets, we need a color for nun. Do we mark none or not? Nope, don't move yet. Does no. everyone there have a pet? Is there someone who doesn't have any pets? Is there anyone that doesn't have a pet? Yeah, we have some no petters. Yeah, so we'll need a mark none with the color this time. Okay, so what color, Jacob? Um, green. green. And for this one, if you have five dogs, only grab one dog bead. So if you just, if you have more than one dog, you just grab one. But if you have a dog and a cat, you can grab a dog one and a cat one. Is this purple? I would do this. Yeah, we need to make sure our key is colored in. Otherwise, the next part of our activity is going to be really hard. And you have a chicken too. Yeah, you have any other three, two, one. Okay, we're good. Okay, so for subject, we need a color for science, a color for art, and a color for history. But on this one, you just choose one subject that's your favorite. So my favorite is science, so I'll put a science bead on my pipe cleaner. Okay, does everybody have one? All right, we're ready to the next one. Wait, I need a gold key for audio. All right, for our last one for explore, we'll do the same thing that we did for subject. So we need a color for beach, a color for mountain, a color for new planet, and you just choose one of those that you would want to explore the most. Okay, what colors do we have left, Josie? Okay, I think we've got it. 
Awesome. So now that you have, do you have, once you have all your beads on your bracelet, you can now tie your band onto your wrist. You guys can twist them like a twisty tie. Yep. Make sure all your beads are in the middle of your pipe cleaner so that way they don't fall off as you're tying it onto your wrist. All right, we are good. Awesome. So we are going to dive just a little deeper into migration really quick before our next part of our activity. So we already talked about what migration is. It's the movement from one place to another for various reasons. So who are some creatures that migrate? Jacob. Birds. Yeah. Are there any other things that migrate? Butterflies. Mm -hmm. Insects. Any other, are there any other animals? Squirrels. Squirrels, not necessarily, kind of. They move from one place to another. It'd be a very short distance. So we also have some whales and fish migrate in the ocean. We have some mammals that migrate like caribou. So we have quite a few creatures that migrate. Now, where do they go when they migrate? We'll talk specifically about birds for this where one. Where do you guys think they go? They want south. South, they said. Yeah, some go south. Micah? Okay, so she said a warmer place. Yeah, so a lot of birds, when we think about migration, especially in the fall, they're going to a warmer place. So they go somewhere that provides all of their needs to survive. So it has enough food, water, and shelter for the birds to survive. Sometimes that's south. Right now we're in spring migration and birds are heading back north. And then some birds, they only migrate a short distance they usually live at high elevations and in the fall, they move down to lower elevations. So think of like mountain alpine birds. And then in the spring, they move back to higher. So it really depends on the species, but yeah, a lot of birds, especially in the, um, our hemisphere of the world, they go south for the winter. Nice. Why do we mi they migrate? We talked about they migrate because it's too cold. They can't really survive in the cold out here up here is there any other reason that birds migrate Josie what do you think the feathers yeah so they can't stay warm so we have the cold if you're a bird that likes to eat fruit or insects do you think you'd find a lot of those around in the winter no no so they need to migrate in order to eat the food that they like to eat since it's not around all it's year round up here and then how do we know all of this information about migration? How do we know, guys? How do we know all this? Vegan. Uh, Studying them outside, he said. Mm -hmm. Following them. Yeah, yeah, so there are various ways to learn all of this information. We've talked about one of them, bird banding is one way we can learn about migration, observations, there's other studies scientists can do, and there's still more to learn. We definitely do not know everything about migration, especially as how do they know where they're going um, and some of the whys and everything. So there's still a lot to learn. So now what we are gonna do with part two is we are gonna collect our data. So at bird banding stations, our banders collect data on the birds they capture, but we are going to collect data on our classmates based on their bands. So this is why it was really important to make sure you were coloring in your key because you'll need that because you'll need to go to five different classmates and record data on them based on their band. So you can use your key to help you identify what all the beads mean. And then we have our table here. I know there's more than five spots, so if later after we're done with our time, you wanna go collect more data, you can, but right now we just need to collect data from five different classmates and fill in our table. 
All right, guys, so you're going to stand up. You're going to figure out that info based on their beads. So you're going to need your key. When you see somebody already has a partner, you need to move on. Only pairs of two. If you don't have a partner, come to the middle. All right, so if everyone wants to finish on the person that they're on right now and then go take a seat, that would be great. We are running to the end of our time. Okay, we are ready. Matthias, you're back at your seat. Thank you. All right, so we're good. Just with the data that we collect from bird banding, we don't just collect that data for fun, even though it is a fun time to collect data, I think so. That's the scientist in me. Um, we actually use the data that's collected from bird banding, and you'll be able to use the data that you collected from your classmates in an activity that you can do after this program, because unfortunately we won't have time to complete it before we're done, before your next session. But how do we use our bird banding data? Well, first and foremost, we use it to understand bird migration routes and how those connect to one of each other. So connecting their breeding grounds up north. So this is our Wilson's warbler that has been banded or recovered at various sites throughout North America. So you can see breeding happening all the way up in Alaska and Canada in the western part of the United States. And then they're stopping over in the western part of the United States. We have quite a few dots in Colorado. That's where some of our other bird banding stations are. To all the way down south to southern Texas, to southern Mexico and Central America for wintering grounds. And so other data that we collect is the changes in population over time, seeing if the population's increasing, decreasing. Here we have pine siskins, which it looks like it's increasing based on 2020, but that was just an eruption year. So it means it was a very big year for pine siskins. So this one fluctuates from year to year. On, and these are just the ones we banded. We can also check on changes in the timing of migration. Are birds migrating sooner? Are they migrating later? And then finally is the lifespan of birds. So here we have an albatross, which is a seabird. And you can see she is banded. And I know this is a she because there's a lot of data on her. She was banded her first year. So her hatch year is what it's called. And her name is Wisdom. And scientists originally thought that albatrosses only live to be about 20 years old, maybe a little more than that. Well, Wisdom turned 70 last year, 70 years old. So it blew scientists' expectations for how long they live. And so banding has been doing that ever since it started 100 years ago. And we've learned that songbirds typically, they live um, around, they have a lifespan of around 10 to 12 years. And so that has been one cool piece of information we've learned from banding. So with the last part of your worksheet, and we won't have time to work on this together, but I encourage you to do this later if you have time, is there's a blank graph for you to analyze your data that you collected from your classmates. So later you can collect more data on the rest of your classmates and then use that to make some type of graph, analyze it, use that information to learn more about your class as a whole, just how banders learn more about birds as a whole from banding, banding individuals. My example here is I took the exploration and the age categories and I made a graph that way. So I found that 10 to 11 year olds wanted to explore the mountains more than anywhere else. And the eight to nine year olds wanted to explore the beach more than anywhere else. So I had explore on my X axis and the number of students in each category as my Y axis. And then my two graphs are in my key for eight to nine and 10 to 11. 
So you, I left it open so you can choose how you want to analyze your data. It is completely up to you. And that is all that we have for you today. Are there any final questions before we get ready to send you on to your next session? There are a couple. Josie, she said, how did you catch them? Yes, so the birds are caught in what's called a mist net. And so it's a long net anywhere from six meters to 12 meters long. And it's really thin and it's hard to see. So it's set in between bushes and trees and prime bird habitat. And as the birds are flying, they don't see it and they hit the net and they drop down into a hammock-like part of the net. And they're there until a bander comes by and grabs it. Sometimes they escape, sometimes they hit it and fly back out. The net isn't always effective with catching birds. Jacob, how long have you guys been catching birds for? We have been banding birds here in Nebraska since 2007 in Wildcat Hills and then 2008 up at Chadron State Park. And they've been banding birds longer at our stations in Colorado. I'm not exactly sure when those all started. Nice. Do you, what do you guys do if they're hurt? Do you try so, to help them? We, the banders try to help the birds as much as possible. They do have like little super glue and some blood clotting material for the birds if it's injured that way with like a cut on the leg. Um, they try to do whatever possible. The bird safety is the number one priority. So the nets are made so that they're not necessarily gonna get hurt. Sometimes a bird just really thrashes around and may get injured or stuck really bad. So we try to do as much as possible and help them in the field. Because if we try to take them to a, a wildlife rehab, a lot of the times the birds won't make it there or they they just get really stressed out and they won't make it to the rehab. Do they ever get like too stuck in the net? So sometimes we get birds that like to thrash around a lot and they get extra stuck in the net because um, the net is full of tiny little holes and loops and so they can get pretty twisted and tangled in there. If it's too tangled that we can't unravel it by ourselves, we will make some salt, small cuts into the net to help untangle the bird. So Costa, is it actually possible for like the bird to go over the net? Yep. Can they go over the net? They can fly over it. So it, the net sits, oh gosh, probably it varies usually about 10 feet in the air max, no higher than that. And so it is very possible for a bird just to fly right over it and not hit the net at all. Okay, so would question. like a volleyball net kind of be accurate to say yeah. what it's like, Miss Delaney? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so about the height of a volleyball net is about as tall as our nets are. Okay, good. Deegan, last one. Have you ever accidentally hurt a bird? Have they ever accidentally hurt a bird? Not to my knowledge. So our banders are trained in how to properly handle the birds from extracting to handling them while they're taking measurements. The bird safety is the number one priority. We want to make sure the birds stay safe and stress-free as much as possible. So our banders aren't allowed to handle birds until they know how to properly handle them to keep them safe. All right. Thank you. That sounds good. Those are some good questions, guys. Yes. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you. We did. Yes. Thanks, guys. Let's do our hands. Thank you.